Welcome, Leah and Geraldine. I'm going to have you introduce yourselves so people can get a sense of your voice and put your voice to your name, because sometimes when we have more than one person on, it's hard to remember who is who. So glad to have you here. And maybe, Leah, you can start by just introducing who you are, where, where your work is, and what you care about that brought you here. So I'm Leah Aguirre. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm in private practice and provide individual therapy in California. I'm based out of San Diego, but I do telehealth all over California. Um, I do a lot of work with young adults that have struggled with complex trauma, um, childhood abuse, and then leaving domestic violence situations or have been in abusive relationships. And welcome, Geraldine. Thank you. Um, my name is Geraldine O'Sullivan. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I currently practice as a school social worker at a large public high school in San Diego County, um, and I work out of our wellness center. And so the group that I'm working with is teenagers, like 14 to 18. So both of you are boots on the ground. You know, sometimes on this show, I have researchers on, and then sometimes I have people that are thinking and writing books. You are in the trenches with the teens day in and day out, the young adults, and seeing what things they really struggle with. And what I noticed in looking at your work is that you do understand what is current for teens, what's up for them, everything from online dating to how to identify their self-worth to understanding their own sexuality. And one of the concerns that parents, caregivers, and even therapists have is they know the things that they want for young adults. They want them to be healthy and happy and make good choices and all those things, but they don't always know how to support teens in doing that. So what is your first go-to in working with teenagers? Like Geraldine. Yeah. <laughs> I think that building rapport is really important with the teens and just finding something to connect with them on, like right off the bat. And having teens understand that, at least in my case, you know, um, therapy services are optional. So nobody's forcing them to be there. They have the right to consent to those services. And so I think a lot of teens sometimes feel like somebody's making me come here or there's something wrong with me and that's why I have to talk to someone and really reframing that for them and helping them to understand that it, they have the right to consent and then checking in with them and building rapport and building connection with them and finding some common ground. I think that really helps them to feel comfortable and make that connection initially. Teenagers, they kind of feel a little bit trapped by adults sometimes or, or controlled. So it's this time where teenagers need to start making some decisions for themselves and try some things out. Parents and adults need to let go a little bit, but they also still need some guidance. One of the things that you write about is starting with values with teens. And it's a little bit different, I think, working on values with teens than working on values with adults. And how would you suggest for parents or caregivers to start to have conversations around values? What are some of the things that you talk about? Maybe Leah, you can answer this one. A lot of what it comes down to is casual and open conversations with between parents and their kids about what values are and in a non-complicated way. So describing what family values are. So, you know, we appreciate quality time together. We have dinner at the dinner table together. That's something we as a family do. But then also encouraging or really using that as an example to foster their own individual and unique identity and what them as individuals as a teen value. So again, feeding them information, like, you know, you love spending time with your friends. That's important to you. So I want to help you to foster those relationships and prioritize those relationships and really encourage them outside of relationships, romantic relationships, and even school. If, if friendships are important to you, how can we fit that into your daily life? That's a big part of ACT, as you know, is really like clarifying those values and really giving them examples and then helping them to, to facilitate those relationships. It's also role modeling it. So say if you're a parent and you're not really prioritizing your own values and the things that are important to you, a kid's not going to, your child's not going to really know that that's something that's important to do as they become adults. So role modeling it. So if you're a parent that really enjoys being artistic and creative, like showing them that and spending time, taking time out of your day to foster those, those values and the things that matter to you most. With friendships and relationships, it's interesting with teens. And I see it as like teens values are developing. They're in, they're in process. Like part of being a teenager is figuring out what your values are mm -hmm. because you have the modeling from your parents and your job is to go like explore the world, take risks, be in relationships and figure out, Ooh, I don't like that. Or, Ooh, I like that. Mm -hmm. And use that kind of tuning fork to figure out for yourself. And with relationships in particular, I think it's, it's hard because they're kind of juggling three different things. They're often they're juggling. Okay. My parents' expectations for me, Mm -hmm. 
maybe four things. My parents' expectation for me, society's expectations of what a relationship looks like. So when we talk about romantic relationships, the actual expectations of the person that they're with, and then maybe their own inner knowing of what's right for them or what's wrong for them. And sometimes that inner, that inner knowing is Mm -hmm. like way at the bottom. (laughs) All those other things are on top. So how do you help, help teens uncover that, listen to that, be able to voice it with more confidence? I mean, for me, I think it's just really giving them space to think about it. A lot of the book, what we talk about in our book is just that cognitive dissonance and that feeling in your body when something doesn't sit well with you or something doesn't feel right with you and knowing that that could cue you into, okay, this doesn't align with the things that are important to me or the values that I have. I know it's so vague, but that feeling of discomfort is a is a really important thing for our, our youth to start recognizing and knowing that that might tell them that there's something that they're doing that's at odds with their greater value system. And it's really hard with peer influences and peer pressure and, like you said, social expectations, what they're seeing on social media to really listen a little bit more deeply. It is hard. What I talk about with my clients, both teens and adults, is that your values can shift and change. And sometimes we have values that will be at the forefront of our minds and values that will take the back seat. And it's really just kind of figuring out that balance and what feels good and works well. Well, let's talk a little bit about romantic relationships. A lot of your work has focused on that and helping kids navigate choosing partners, navigate their own sexuality, getting curious about their own sexuality. And uh, one of, I think, parents and caregivers and even therapists' least favorite topic with uh, teenagers (laughs) is talking about sex and sexuality. We're scared of it, so we don't talk about it. We avoid it. And it's actually, I think there's really, it's really important to be able to do that. These are really hot topics right now. And I think teenagers and young adults actually probably know more about them and have more education around it than their parents and caregivers often do, or their therapists do. How do you approach these types of conversations with kids? And what are some of the common fears that adults have around having conversations around sexuality and sexual orientation? I think the more we tiptoe around these topics and these uh, of identity and sexual identity, the more kids are going to be flailing and feeling unsupported. That can lead to real, like them accessing inaccurate information, going to people that aren't necessarily trustworthy or the best supports for them. So something that Geraldine and I have really focused on in our book is really encouraging them to talk to safe adults. And even if that's not their parent, which we really hope that it is their parent, we really hope that they have a safe parent or caregiver they can go to and talk about these things with, but really going to safe parents, whether it's a counselor at school, whether it's a therapist, whether it's an older adult in their family, like an aunt, uncle, or cousin even, right? That they can go to to talk about it, as well as familiarize themselves with the resources out there. They do know a lot, but a lot of it is from social media. So the more we can support them in getting to the, you know, to safe and accurate information, the better, the better they'll be prepared to navigate certain discussions and conversations. I think kids today are relying so much on peers and social media, which is great because they have a network and community of people that oftentimes are very supportive of their identity. However, it can also lead to, you know, challenges having the communication skills to really navigate conversations with adults about their identity and sexual orientation, sexuality, and preparing for those tough conversations with partners about sex and decisions around sex. I imagine anyone listening to this episode wants to be a safe adult. That's why they care about this, right? A lot of times we don't have that information ourselves and we didn't get the experience of safe, be having a safe adult to talk about our sexuality or talk about sex before having sex. And I could imagine if we surveyed everyone listening, how many of them the first time they had sex did not have <laughs> a conversation or thought it out or it, it was so, it sort of like happened and maybe it was consensual and maybe it wasn't consensual. So it does feel like there's also an important part for us as as adults to look at our own history and our own um, uh, sort of traumas, I guess, also that, that block us from talking with kids. But what, what are some of the things that, that a safe adult would coach a kid around or a teen around? Um, in, we'll start, first just start around like in terms of like intimacy and relationships. What are some of the top things that are important to be focusing on having conversations about? Um, Well, one thing I also just wanted to mention, too, regarding sexual orientation and how 
safe adults can um, build, like normalize those conversations, especially therapists, for example. Like what I've done is I've built those questions into my my intake process. So it really normalizes it for all of my youth that I work with is what what name do you want me to call you? What's your pronoun that you use? And and doing that with everyone. So no one feels singled out. It and I I of course ask them if they're comfortable sharing that with me. But you know, it really normalizes that. And I've even heard from teachers that they do that in the classroom on the first day of school. They'll pass around like a little index card to every student and say, please write down your name and your pronoun and a fun fact about you. And it just normalizes it for everyone. And then the teacher has that information and doesn't have to worry about misgendering anyone in the classroom. And so those are ways that adults can can be a safe adult. And, and actually, they don't even necessarily have to have like a whole big conversation about it until the teen wants to, but it just normalizes it. And it tells that teen, okay, this person is safe for me to talk to. They, they get it, you know? And then later, if the teen does want to bring up any questions related to their sexual orientation or gender identity or sexual practices that they might be engaging, they, they may be more likely to come to that person once they feel that they are um, safe to talk to. And um, getting back to your question about what are some ways to have conversations around sex with teens, part of what we talk about in the book is helping teens to identify their values, identify their, if they are having any things around like, what are my limits or what are my boundaries, kind of exploring that, ideally exploring that before you enter a situation so that you kind of know what you're ready or not ready for. And then also considering how am I going to talk to my partner about things? Like, how am I going to talk to my partner about what I'm ready for or what if I change my mind and or how are we going to talk about sexual health and just kind of exploring ways like conversation starters for how to talk about that. Because, you know, a lot of young people haven't had those conversations yet and they're not sure how to bring things up. And so um, that can that's something that adults can be helpful with the teens is prepping them for that. I also think part of being well, just being a parent and a safe person for your child or just a teen in general is talking about what healthy relationships generally look like across the board. So not just romantic relationships, but with friends and peers and talking about the importance of respect, the importance of open communication, the importance of feeling seen and heard and building trust in a relationship. Again, that can be with both friends and partners. And I think when you can just give that guidance and one thing, you know, and my parents are both social workers and very liberal and progressive and all the things, but there were no conversations. And I just think because we weren't there yet as a society about what it means to be in a healthy relationship and in a healthy friendship. And so just encouraging your child or your youth, whoever that may be, a family member, to know that it's okay if you're not feeling safe or comfortable with someone that you don't have to do anything, whether it's have sex or engage in a conversation or go out with them to a party it really matters in how you feel and if you feel really seen and heard by your friend or partner. And I think just even empowering youth to do that, to know that they have the ability to choose who they spend time with, who they invest their, their, you know, their emotions and is, is incredible and important as they navigate relationships and romantic relationships in the future. One of the things that I'll do with young adults around healthy relationships is I'll have them kind of identify Give me some examples of people in your life that you think that you admire their relationships, whether it's social media, people on social media or people for real in your, you know, in your day to day that you see or um, your own parents. What are the qualities that you admire? And then what are the what are examples of unhealthy relationships? We just get a sense there's something off there and what's going on there. And now you have from from both of those, you can start to identify what your what your values are and in, in what you want in a relationship. And we then we write them down on note cards. And then I have like a, you know, a floor in front of them. And I say, okay, when we, when you meet someone and you're, and you're kind of in the early stages, put this note card on the floor in terms of how close they are to you in terms of the values that you want to pursue and how far away are they? So you can get a sense of, is this person lining up? And a lot of times with teens, they're just sort of fall, they're like falling into the relationship without thinking about it. And then they have to kind of backtrack and and think about it, one of the things I really liked about what you said in here, and this has to do with flexibility, is that, and and consent, is that it's okay if if you've fallen into it and you've gotten this far and maybe you're having sex with someone or maybe you've started to get on that path to to backtrack and say, you know what, actually, I I don't think I'm ready. And at any point along the way, you you can change your mind. And that is some of the messaging that I don't think, at least I got, 
it was sort of it was sort of like, okay, I'm locked in now. Now I did this thing, and now I like have to do this thing. But I really like how you talk about consent with teens. And can you share with us a little bit more? Like, wh- what does consent mean, and how do you talk with teens about understanding that word? So I think that when it comes to consent, um, you know, really you're discussing like permission or an agreement. So when two partners are consenting, they're both giving each other permission and agreeing to whatever's happening. Um, And so consent can be given verbally. Like there can be a discussion of like, are we ready to have sex or, or any stage of physical intimacy? And there can be just regular conversations about that, but it can also be given non-verbally. So that's something I think it's really important to teach the teens about is that this whole idea of like no means no or yes means yes is like kind of outdated now. And there's a lot of it's consent is much more nuanced than that. And so teaching kids that if someone's body language is not indicating that they're interested in what's happening, then that might be a sign to stop. So if someone is, you know, really tense or kind of their whole body is like frozen or rigid, um, then that might be an indicator that they're feeling uncomfortable. And that maybe the partner should stop and check in and say, hey, are you, are you, do, are you okay with this? Um, and in the contrast, if the person is, you know, indicating maybe their body language is they're reciprocating, they're leaning towards their partner, they're engaged, they're, um, you know, showing through their body language that they are consenting, then that can also be a sign that consent is being given. And so um, there's verbal and nonverbal ways to consent. And I think um, not all teens know that. They don't always know how to identify that. And so having conversations around that is important. And I think to what you said earlier, you know, some adults are are nervous or uncomfortable with talking to teens about sex, and that's totally understandable. But I also think that we have to model, we have to model these conversations for the teens. Like we can't expect them to have healthy conversations with their partners around sex if we are struggling to have conversations with them about it. So being, um, you know, just ha- having that floor be open to have those conversations and show them what a comfortable conversation can look like around that will also help them have those conversations with their partners, whether it's around the relationship or consent or whatever they're doing. Yeah, the conversations, at least in my household, are woven into daily life. It's not like we have a conversation about sex. I try and I try and bring it up in <laughs> different ways. The other day, I was sitting on a beanbag watching a basketball game with my son. And I reached my arm up and then I slowly put it around him and then put it around, put, and I said, okay, this is what it's going to be like when you're at a movie. You're going to spend like the first 30 minutes trying to figure out, should I put my arm around them or should I not put my arm around them? Should I, you know, and then you're going to get your arm around them and then you're going to feel stuck. Now I can't move my arm. So just having that kind of conversation is, okay, we can, we can talk about the awkwardness here. This is awkward. It's going to be, it's going to be awkward. There's nothing more awkward than being a teenager figuring out. And as adults, it's still awkward. Sex is still awkward with married couples that have been together for years. It's, it, you know, it's just an awkward thing. So getting into that space of it's normal for you to feel awkward. It's normal for you to be uncomfortable in your body and, and then to feel, you know, excitement. And, but that is one thing that I've, really learned from um, my therapy work is that the more that, like you said, if you start to, if you start the first day of school using pronouns, the more that you bring in that into the normal vernacular, the more comfortable kids feel about talking about things about themselves. And that's really the goal. I liked in your book how you, you had um, words for communicating consent and you actually list them out. So you say things like, you could ask your your partner, are you okay with this? Is this okay? Should I keep going? Are you sure? I want to make sure you're comfortable with this. And then you the this, the other side of it is words that you could use to if you don't feel comfortable with something. So you can say things like you want to say, no, I'm not ready yet. I'm still getting to know you. Um, I care about you, but I'm not ready. I don't think I'm comfortable with that. I'd feel more comfortable if you do X, Y, and Z. Sometimes we actually just need to help our kids have the language. And part of that languaging is also our own as adults asking for consent from our kids. Now, I did that arm around my kid on the the beanbag. But as he grows, I can see his own languaging around, I'm less comfortable with you, mom. Like, don't come in my room if I'm naked. Like, don't do that anymore. And, and And being tuned into those barriers and limits that our kids set for us is also really important. 
Definitely. Yeah. I think um, part of why we included that language around consent, like you said, is because it is hard for like if they've never had these conversations and they don't know what to say, then then giving the simple guidance of like these different types of phrases can just it just gives them an outline. It's just helpful. And of course, they're going to use their own words. They're going to say things in the way that they feel comfortable. But we do quite a bit of that in the book, like spelling out ways that you can talk to yourself with your self-talk, your friendships, your partners when you're negotiating physical intimacy. So we do try to put some language in there that can help them to figure out how they want to say things. I think too, the reason why we we want to encourage communication is a lot of a lot of kids feel like they need to have sex or engage in intimate interactions because they don't want to offend their partner. They're worried that their partner won't think they like them or love them anymore. And so also giving them language to communicate, I love you but I'm not ready and this doesn't feel okay to me and really encourage the open dialogue with, within all their relationships. We want to really encourage, again, making informed decisions and empowered decisions. Also being able to communicate their love for someone while setting a boundary. So that's that's why we do a lot of those examples in the book because we want to give kids a language to express love and gratitude and appreciation, but also assert themselves. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. One of the places that kids are having um, a lot more relationships is online. And this is the mysterious world, the mysterious online world that I think caregivers, parents, therapists don't really know what's going on in there. And you have a chapter called, what is it? It's Online Love Doesn't Feel Virtual, which I thought was such a great title because it's true. I think for me as an outsider, I'm like, oh, that's just a virtual relationship. It doesn't really matter. When you're in an online relationship, you can feel deeply connected to someone. And then there's all these other factors around safety and meeting them. And are they really who they say they are that we you know, worry about with, with our teens? So how would you help educate teens around online relationships? Where should we loosen up a little bit as caregivers and adults, and um, but also make sure that they're safe? I think in the past, adults, I mean, maybe even myself included, like years ago, thought, okay, if it's an online relationship, it's it's not safe. Like that they're being yeah. catfished or this isn't a real person or or it's a predator or something, right? In the in the past, we kind of thought of online relationships as like, this is a safety issue uh, across the board and no one should ever date online. And that thinking has changed. Um, it's not realistic to expect that teens today are not going to encounter others online. Um, I, you know, I've worked with many teens who have been in, online, maybe long distance relationships with someone. And so it's, I don't think it's realistic to expect that our teens are never going to meet or engage in um, any kind of conversations with others online. They may not end up in a relationship with someone online, but they, I think they are going to be interacting in that online space. And so we do have to, as caregivers, recognize that, but then we also have to provide guidance on safety for sure, because of course, as we know, there can be predators online, you know, there can be safety issues with meeting people online. And so part of what we discuss in that chapter is sort of walking that line of recognizing the reality and the legitimacy of an online relationship. Because like you said, the teens can feel anyone in an online relationship can feel very deeply about this person who maybe they've never met before, but they've built a connection. Uh, And then also making sure to be, have open and honest conversations with caregivers about that to make sure that the situation is safe, that this person actually is who they say they are, that they actually are, you know, within your same age range. Or, you know, I have conversations with teens I work with about not revealing too much personal information online, uh, about their name or their address or the school that they go to, things like that, just to maintain their general safety online. But I think as caregivers and adults, we have to be careful not to minimize the experience of their online relationship and not to judge it because then teens will typically shut down and they, then they're much more likely to not tell us what's going on. And then that creates a potential for safety issues. If we yeah, don't, it's the know sneakiness, it's the sneakiness that gets, gets us, you got to kind of go with the flow. Otherwise they'll figure out, they're like water. They figure their way yeah. out how to get what they, where they want to go. But so I have a question for you around that. Because there's, there was sort of a sort of suggestion or encouragement for adults to be monitoring, or there is, a, there, there is advice, some people give the advice that adults should be monitoring their teens' online platforms. So checking in on their Instagram, checking in on their Snap, we can't really check in on Snapchat, but checking in on how they're communicating, even their texts. And then there's a whole other 
sort of aspect to that, which is this is these are their private conversations. Was your mom listening to you on the other end of your fo- of the phone when you were a kid and you were like having conversations with your friends? No, that you'd be horrified for your mom to hear what you were saying in those. And obviously, this depends on development, right? A, a ninth grader is different than a you know twelfth tw- grader in this. But what are your suggestions around how much monitoring parents should be doing of their kids' um, platforms and phones and all that? Yeah, it's it's kind of tough. It's up to each individual family. And Leah, you can add your thoughts on this as well. But I, I mean, I think whatever decision a family makes regarding how much they're going to be monitoring their child's messaging or online presence, I think the biggest part of that is making sure that the child also knows that that's the expectation. I think where we get into a lot of trouble is kids are messaging and then their parents are like sneakily like, reading their phone or reading their diary or whatever. And that's where trust gets really broken or kids feel really violated if it's like, oh my gosh, my mom read my private messages. Um, Now, if that child knows, hey, my mom can go through my phone at any minute and that's the rule in my house and she can read my messages anytime, then at least they know that that is the expectation that's set within the family. They may not agree to it or they, you know, they may have their own opinions about it, but the rule and the expectation has been set. And so then the child and the parent both know like, this is how we operate, you know? And um, so I think that that, like there has to be that mutual respect given of like, Hey, I'm your parent. I want to make sure you're safe. Um, I may be asking you from time to time, like who you're talking to or what you're saying to that person or what you're doing online. Um, And I, you know, it's because I care about you and it's because I want you to be safe. It's not because I'm trying to snoop or trying to like be in your business. It's because I I care about you, you know, and making sure that teens understand that and that they don't think that their parent is just being invasive. Well, parents have to check themselves on that too. Like, what are your values around, uh, you know, your kids' online use and why are you going in there? Is this about just, I'm curious, you know, what's happening in their relationship with so-and-so and and I want to know the like latest because they won't talk to me about it. That's different than I'm I'm concerned about their safety. I want to make sure they're not being bullied. It's important to have those conversations, but also first to have that conversation with yourself. What's my why behind this? And does it line up with my values or is there a dissonance there as well? Related to sexuality and um, intimacy and and, and all of this and just being a, a teen and young adult, is body image, and it, it, it is one of the hardest times to be in a body <laughs> is when you're when your your body is changing and growing, and it's not at the same pace as everybody else's, and at the same time, there's so much focus on it. So it's just a you're under a microscope. Uh, how do you work with with teens around body image and helping them get to a place of um, you know body image flexibility? There's conversations that are happening about not necessarily doing not necessarily coining it body positivity, but body neutrality, just because in reality, we're in this world of comparison. And we're also in a culture that really um, profits off, profits off the beauty industry in comparison. And so it's not always possible for a lot of our youth and just adults to feel truly positive about their bodies, but if they can experience more neutrality, that's important too. I really think what Geraldine and I have tried to communicate through the book and what we try to do with our youth and even me with my adults is that we appreciate the diversity of our bodies. What you see on social media, on Instagram, on TikTok is doesn't reflect the diversity of bodies in the world and throughout the world and amongst various cultures. And they're really helping our youth and young adults understand that there is this huge like spectrum of diversity and cultural values and how really it comes down to what we value and appreciate about our bodies, the strength of our bodies, the resiliency of our bodies, the health of our bodies, and even appreciating our group of friends and the diversity in their bodies. And I think more conversations about diversity and and trying to become more aware and mindful of how much we consume social media and what consumption of social media and just media in general does is a big part of our conversations in therapy and with Geraldine in the schools too. Sometimes I'll have a young adult get out their phone and we'll like, okay, let's go through your followers. <laughs> Look at this follower. How do you feel in your body? Do you feel, do you feel bad about yourself? Do you feel, <laughs> you know, and, and maybe this could inform you as you go through each one, which ones you may want to have in your feed. I mean, even just that word feed, what are you feeding yourself on a regular basis? What are you feeding your mind? And if you look at this, this feed and it makes you feel 
you, you feel bad about who you are in, in consuming this feed. Maybe you need to either unfollow or there's a way you can, my partner, uh, yeah, you can mute them without them knowing that you're unfollowing them. This is like the, you can probably Google this and figure it out. I've done it with a few folks. <laughs> It's very helpful. Uh, and and the, the, that, is, that can be helpful. So what are you feeding yourself? But then also starting to expand our understanding of the body beyond appearance, like the earth suit that people see, but also this is a thing that's functioning in certain ways. Sometimes it's not functioning. Sometimes it's able in some areas and there's disability in other areas. And looking at that as diversity and that that is an ever-changing thing as well to assume that our bodies are always going to stay the same. The hard part is our bodies also become things that other people talk about. And one of the uh, common things that parents talk about, one of the first things that I notice you go to an event, like a holiday event or a party, is people comment on your body. And uh, especially if you're a teacher, oh, you've grown so much, or you're so pretty, or there's a lot of comments that adults make about teenagers and young adult bodies. And it's just like pouring kerosene on something that is already smoldering. As parents and, and caregivers, we need to stop making body-based comments. <laughs> we just say that flat out. So think of, and even comments to each other. Oh, so-and-so's voice has changed, or oh, so-and-so is getting so tall. And that is not, it's not necessary to make that kind of appearance-based or body-based comment. I think even when it's a compliment or when it's well-intentioned, it can still be damaging because you don't know how that teen is feeling about their body. You don't know also what they're what they're doing. I mean, maybe they're developing eating disorder um, types of behaviors and then it, that might be going unnoticed and then somebody's making a comment that they perceive as like a well-intentioned compliment and then it's sort of reinforcing sometimes really unhealthy habits. And so I think, like you said, even compliments can be damaging and it's best just, just to kind of stop commenting entirely on people's bodies and focus more on things that they're doing well or or, you know, positive characteristics that they have about their personality, or there's so many other things to compliment someone on than what their body looks like. We really are trying to encourage self-worth as being something that is not conditional and has to, you know, fully linked to our appearance. And I think that's the thing that it's hard and it's hard for parents to do, especially because parents have their own insecurities and they look in the mirror and have their own critical thoughts and statements that they say to themselves in front of their kids, not not purposefully or intentionally, but that's something too that as parents and just adults, we need to be more mindful of is how we talk about ourselves and our bodies and other people's bodies, not even in our families. As we're in the grocery store, if we're making a comment or we're passing judgment, those are internalized in our youth. And I don't think we realize that because we're not speaking to them and we're not directing those comments at our kids. But at the end of the day, they internalize it. We all internalize it. They internalize the expectation, right? So right. yeah, you're making a comment about aunt so-and-so and how you know she's gained so much weight. Your kid is hearing that and saying, oh, I better not gain weight because then you know, I'll be like aunt so-and-so and my mom will talk about me or my dad will mm -hmm. talk about me or, you know. So absolutely, the language, it's, this is what's scary about <laughs> being a caregiver is like, oh gosh, I, you know, they're, they're, they're taking in everything. And that doesn't, it's okay. I mean, you can then go back and be like, oh gosh, why am I talking about you know, so-and-so's body? That is none of my business. And you can, you can correct, right? So we also can backtrack a little bit and, and, and make mistakes and all of that. But certainly uh, body image is one that uh, you, it's hard to escape having, like you said, you know, it's, it's, body positivity may be um, a, a, an ideal that is difficult to achieve. There's body neutrality in ACT. We, we use the word uh, body, body image flexibility, which is even if you have negative feelings about your body show up, can you still act on your values? And so that may be something like in, in an intimate relationship, you may have negative feelings about um, parts of your body, maybe the size of something or the squishiness of something else. Could you still act on your values if you feel like you want closeness with a person to let that person hug you? Because I've seen, you know, teens that won't, won't ever let themselves be touched or won't let themselves go and enjoy activities that they enjoy uh, because they're, they're so driven by the um, negative body image thoughts and beliefs about themselves. And then that can sometimes can change the way you feel about yourself. How you behave can change how you feel. One more thing that parents and caregivers and therapists will encounter in being with young adults and teens is breakups. Oh, it's so painful. There's nothing more painful than a breakup. Ugh. How do we uh, help our young adults 
get through a breakup? Like what are, what are some of the tips and tools you help them with? One of the things that I think adults sometimes have a tendency to do, which unfortunately can be a little damaging. So I just want to mention it and then go on to how they can more positively support their teen is sometimes they can kind of minimize the relationship by saying like, well, you're young, like, you know, this was puppy love or whatever. And they kind of, um, and they're doing it very well intentioned. You know, they're kind of trying to instill hope in their child. Like, it's okay, you're young, you'll meet someone else. And that, that of course, is probably true. But what the teen feels on the other end of that is like, oh, they don't get how serious this was for me. They don't understand how much I loved this person. They don't think that I can even love this person. They don't realize that I thought maybe I was going to marry this person, right? And so I think as caregivers, we have to recognize that although teens are young or it may be their first relationship... And yes, it's true. They will probably go on to have other relationships. We don't want to send messages that we're minimizing that experience. We really want to recognize how deeply the per- they did feel about their partner and let them know that like, hey, I know that this is really hard for you right now. Um, this was a really big relationship in your life. You know, how can I help you through this? Like, and then kind of suggesting maybe healthy coping skills and just supporting the teen through that time. Um, rather than just kind of like placating them or telling them they'll meet someone else, but really just recognizing the depth of that relationship and and helping to support them as they're moving past it. You had a, a list in here somewhere where you were like, the the difference between, you know, when you're in a breakup, like crying in bed all day versus allowing yourself to cry and then getting out of bed and going for a walk and just helping that distinction of, yes, cry about it. This is painful. And you are going to climb into bed and you're going to sob your heart out. All of us who were teenagers, we remember there was nothing more painful. Like it was so, our, our emotions are so intense during that time that when you're going through a breakup, it can feel like your heart is being ripped out. And to have an adult invalidate that is, is uh, you know, really problematic. And we, they also need some skills. They need some tools. So coping skills, what are, what are some of the coping schools, skills that you would encourage a teenager to engage in during a breakup? So I think like, you know, just making general suggestions, like if you're seeing them crying in bed all day long, helping them to say, hey, honey, you know, like, let's, let's get up and let's go walk the dog around the block. Um, it, it doesn't have to be anything major. It can be very simple things that can be done from home. Um, but incur- reminding them to eat, you know, I think a, for a lot of teens, when they're going through a breakup, they lose all their appetite or they're not sleeping or they're oversleeping. And so just modeling and giving gentle reminders of like, hey, like, let's get up, like, let's go for a walk. Let's I made this lunch. Do you want to have it? You know, just kind of um, reminding them to take care of themselves. And like, let's put on a funny movie together or something like that. It can be very basic, but um, tapping into the things that you know, your child usually enjoys, or just things that they um, like to do, and then trying to give gentle reminders or suggestions to engage in that activity. And also, being flexible if they don't want to. It's not about forcing them out of the house. It's not about forcing them to eat, but because it they have to do this in their own process. But giving those gentle reminders and consistently following up with that support because um, it's going to take some time. And I also um, mentioned to caregivers that unfortunately for teens um, who are experiencing suicidality, sometimes a breakup can actually be one of the biggest um, risk factors for that. And so that doesn't mean that any teen going through a breakup is going to feel suicidal. Um, but as for parents and caregivers, if they're noticing a, re- a decline in their child's mental health during a breakup, um, it never hurts to just ask that question and check in with your child if they're having any thoughts like that. So you're making sure that they're safe. Because if they're not thinking about that, they'll be like, oh, no, mom, like, that's not where I'm at. You know, <laughs> like, um, but if they are, then that opens the door to have a healthy communication about their mental health surrounding the breakup, too. Yeah. And that's just part of the ongoing conversation. Sometimes people feel so bad, they want to hurt themselves. Have you ever felt that way? You know, and and, and sometimes people feel so bad, they actually do hurt themselves, like they cut themselves or, you know, do other things to navigate, you know, that feeling. Have you ever known anyone that's done that? Or have you ever thought about that? Again, it's if you don't talk about it, it doesn't mean it isn't there. And that's the, (laughs) that's the thing that I think as adults and parents are like, I just want to talk about it. So I don't ever have to know that that's happening, but it is there. And if it's there and your kid is sharing it with you, then now we're, now we actually have something to work with. Like that in itself, just your child being able to express how they're feeling and what they're going through is an intervention. 
that is an intervention. That's a lot of what the intervention of therapy is, is having a space to talk about these things that are usually stuck inside of you and you are navigating alone. So that's great. Sometimes I will give the, the two week rule and I'll say, you know, two weeks from now, it's very likely you're going to feel differently than how you do now. And if you're not feeling differently, not that the feeling of the breakup is going to go away, just we hope that by two weeks from now, we're going to start to not be so intense in the breakout. If it's not, then we also need to look at some things that are maybe keeping the, the breakup around. So staying connected on social media, watching, uh, watching people is not super helpful. It's good to kind of remove the cues to that person that you're, if you're really final about the breakup. Maybe you need to fill in some friends and other people in place and do some activities with other people that you were doing all the time with that one person. Because a lot of times teenagers, they get siloed off in their relationships as well. Any tips that we kind of close up here, any tips that you want to make sure that we didn't mention that you want to make sure that we do for parents and caregivers of teens? I always talk to, because I see a lot of adults as well, and I always talk to my adults that are so up. A lot of the adults that I see are, you know, coming in to process their own childhood trauma and their own relational trauma with their own parents and caregivers. And they're so fearful of messing up and doing the same thing to their own child. And they really are trying to avoid it completely. And so a lot of the conversations I will have is just honest conversations that you are human. You are going to mess up. You're not going to have all the answers. You're not going to be able to do things perfectly. And you're going to at times react in a way that you're not proud of or that's not the most helpful or effective. But at the end of the day, taking accountability and just showing your child your human, you know, your humanness and being able to own up to it and then apologize and take accountability when needed. That's all that really matters. Because at the end of the day, just when we talk about being a safe person, it's knowing that your child can go to you. And even if you don't have all the right answers or know exactly what to say, that they know you'll be there for them regardless. Yeah, showing your your flaws and some degree of vulnerability to your kids too, that you don't have everything figured out, but gosh, you are doing your best to be on their side and you are learning along with them and you will admit that you don't know everything and that you were wrong. That also makes you a safe person, right? So a perfect person isn't a safe person. A person that, that can't admit their mistakes is not a safe person, right? So that's okay to make mistakes and, um, and model that to your kids as well. Good. Well, your book is the... The Girl's Guide to Relationships, Sexuality, and Consent. Uh, I've already had my boy take a look at it, and he, it's on his reading list because, it, well, first of all, you say this, you know, we use, the, we use the word girl, but we're being inclusive here in terms of, um, you know, sort of your identity. And I actually think, I was like, I, this, is, this is my buy-in with him, as I said. He's 13. I said, you know, you got to read what the, what the therapists are telling the girls. <laughs> He, uh, he likes girls. And so I was like, you got to read with theirs because then, then you'll, you'll have like an insider's view. And then he's also going to get some languaging of when she says, hold on, wait, or she tenses up. That's a time for you to, you know, back off, dude. And that's an important skill for him to learn. Um, and it's my responsibility as mom to help him learn those skills. So Girl's Guide to Relationships, Sexuality and Consent. You can just put a sticky note over girls and put boys and non-binary and all of that. Thank you so much for being on the show. This has been really fun and informative to learn from you. And I'll connect to both of your, uh, all of your stuff um, in the show notes. People want to work with you directly. Both of you have private practices. As well I, as I don't. Leah does. Okay. So Leah has a private practice. The rest of you will be hopeful that your kid goes to Geraldine's school <laughs> <she> works <laughs> at in San Diego. <laughs> and um, also you have other ways of communicating. Leah, you have a podcast you're on as well? The Certified Mom is Boy podcast. Radio Personality from San Diego started his own podcast. So we do Mental Health Mondays. I'm on that every week. Cool. Certified Mom is Boy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got one of those. Um, <laughs> that's good. Okay, good. Okay, well, thank you so much, the two of you. Thanks for, for having us. Your time with me. Thank yeah. you. Take care.